Welcome back to another episode of Destin Talks to Random Cool People. This one might be a little bit different because I have a, an old friend on the show. This is Cheapy D from Cheap Ass Gamer, if you haven't heard of uh, the website before. Uh, Cheapy D runs it. It is great to see you. It has been a very long time. It's been a very long time. Yes. If you haven't heard of that website that's been around for 20 years, uh, yeah, that's Cheap Ass Gamer. And Destin and I have known each other for how many years? Like, you know, not 20 probably, but maybe 15, 15 to 20. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, gaming we... industry is small, you know? So like, if you start going to E3 a lot, you <laughs> tend to meet, I mean, I don't know what it's obviously E3 is dead now, and but it's like a big, small industry. So if you get to sort of know people who stick around, you know, stick around, <laughs> who you see year after year, you're like, I know that guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's great to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. We started out, uh, or we were introduced via hard news where we would do a segment and you would introduce like the cheap deals. It was a thing that we did back in the day. And, uh, we got to hang out once when I was in Japan for some reason, I, one of my jobs that I've had over the years. And we did like, uh, we did airsoft guns or something. <laughs> there was a bar. I think you must've been there for Tokyo game show. Probably. Sure, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they have a bar, uh, you know, at least one bar that where you can go and have drinks, but also they have a catalog of airsoft guns that you can choose from. And they're, air, they're a, a catalog and like, these are guns, famous guns that you would know from movies. Mm -hmm. So like the shotgun from Terminator 2, Robocop's gun, yeah, so on and so forth. And you can just pick one out of the catalog and then you can shoot it in like this really small shooting range like a mm -hmm. shooting range for one basically in the in like the back of the bar so do you remember what gun you shot robocop's gun yeah it was the robocop's I, gun okay. i do remember there's a, the photo of it pops up sometimes but yeah that was a lot of fun i i feel like it was a million years ago and i was much younger uh time goes by so fast you know just yes. just with industry stuff uh today i thought i would ask you a little bit about cheap ass gamer you said you've been running it for about 20 years um how has the business in in your mind changed since it started out 20 years ago the gaming business or the cheap ass gamer business both actually the cheap ass gamer business has changed because you know social media did not exist you know when we started mm -hmm. and social media definitely took a huge chunk out of like every forum that existed and if you look at a lot of forums that existed 20 years ago what percentage of those are, are still around today? Mm -hmm. 1%, you know, if that. Um, so that's one huge difference. And, you know, we, we try to adapt in that, you know, we post all our stuff on social media. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a lot like the gaming industry and like it's hard to put out like a, a big AAA game now because you have these time sinks that are sucking everybody's available hours away. The Fortnites, the the uh, Roblox, the mm. the games of service. So now there's a million different internet things that are pulling your attention away from sites like Cheap Ass Gamer, just like these games of a service, like, like you know, like the five or six big ones are pulling yeah. out all the play time for the regular games. Mm -hmm. um, but of course you also have like subscription services now, digital distribution, which didn't exist back then. So a lot of ways, which makes cheap ass gamer not as necessary yeah. for uh, to put, you know, or, um, but you know, it is what it is. And certainly it's provided me a good living for a long, you know, way longer than it should have. So like, I can't, you know, I'm not, not bitter at all. <laughs> um, uh, and game wise, I'm not bitter at all either. Like I'm still playing apex legends. I don't have to learn any new games. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, industry wise, if you think about it, like when when we were when you and I were doing that segment on hard news, just for some context, we used to shoot that show on VHS, like the little cassettes, and then we would have to play them back into a recorder and then record them until we went digital like a, a year or two in. But like we were still doing editing in that style. And for your segments, I imagine we probably just captured that to a device or something at the point at that time. Or do you remember if you sent it in, recorded it local? But like I'm pretty sure 
I had like a webcam or something mm -hmm. that like, you know, must have been, the resolution must have been <laughs> very low. Um, but I'm pretty sure I must have emailed you the files, right? Like how else, how else could I have done it? Yeah, either we recorded it or you emailed them. But man, uh, just just to give you some context about like how far things have come now, you just sit at your computer, you open OBS and you're good to go. The barriers like have been taken down, like like you're talking about barriers from finding cool deals. Uh, yes. I imagine most people can, you know, uh, follow you cheap ass gamer on Twitter or whatever and and get the the deals via that methodology. Um, or go to the website, of course. And then now with media on the media side, things are just way easier. So I sort of wanted to ask you about that because I, I think you have a unique perspective having been doing this for 20 years. How have you seen uh, the media side of it change? In terms of the coverage? Well, just in terms of like, think about how many of the, the big media companies are left. It's like IGN's still there. I'm I'm at IGN. I'm very fortunate. And uh, Kotaku is talking about a, a refocus on guides and GameSpot's still there. Polygon's still there. But there's been this new wave of media where it's more influencer based, right? Sure. And that's been that's been sort of ha happening for a while. And in, in fact, like nobody's surprised. I don't think just like I'm not surprised that Cheap Ass Gamer is less popular because of all these other things popping up. I don't think any of the big sites or were surprised that happened because it ha it didn't happen overnight. You could see <laughs> like, you could see it happening. Um, it is like you say, the barriers to entry are, are really like whether you're a podcaster or any type of content creator, Howard Stern complains about it all the time. He's like, I used to be the only one, like to get my <laughs> opinion out there. I had a radio show and I could reach millions of people. Now, anybody who has just a couple hundred dollars can, put together this, you know, can put together a show and have millions of listeners. You know, it's not as easy as that, obviously, but yeah. it's possible as opposed to impossible as it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so yeah, it is, that's happened everywhere, I think. Do you think that's good? I mean, do I think it's good? Yes <laughs> the and problem no. Is it's a lot of the content bag, is right? bad. A lot, I mean, look, yeah. everything is subjective, of course. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the content though is like people like pulling pranks on each other like like <laughs> yeah, bad like pranks stuff. like pranks yeah. that like would get people like punched should get people punched in the face probably oh like there so, was like, that uh johnny somali who would go around in <laughs> yes. japan and he got arrested right and like that content is terrible and apparently it's really appealing to a younger demographic but i i think it's like awful to watch that sort of stuff. If you don't know the, the story of this particular creator, uh, he goes and just says terrible things in countries where he shouldn't be doing that and saying like racist stuff. And he he had a huge, massive following until he got arrested and he's been kind of not heard from. No, no, he's he just popped up in Thailand, actually. I just oh, watched great. the video before I came on here. Uh, he just popped up in Thailand and he was doing his own thing. And there was like a mob of people like, surrounding him and like trying to fight him so he yeah. ran away i think he was, yeah yeah <laughs> he's <laughs> learning japan like if you're gonna be like an asshole like that in an asian country japan is probably like the best one and you know he still got arrested and went to it jail was until the yakuza started showing up and he did get not and he got knocked <laughs> out too he got yeah. punched in the face too and got knocked out by just some like random white guy on the street mm -hmm. but even still even getting knocked out and going to jail I feel like Japan is still your best bet out of a lot of other Asian countries because they're going to do a lot worse stuff can happen to you there if you're if you're not behaving properly. Let's say, mm -hmm. uh, where are you, where are you currently? Because you lived in Japan for many years. Uh, yes, I'm back in New York. No, I'm in the, I'm in a, I'm on Long Island now. Oh, I'm sorry. Which is a suburb. Of, <laughs> no, no, no. We um. We moved back from Japan and we moved to Manhattan for, you know, just as like a, a landing place. Like, um, and then we just found like a great spot all along on a great house, a great location close to a Japanese grocery store and a Japanese school, which was be good for my son and my wife. Um, so like, we're very happy. I am not moving. Like I'm going to die here. Hopefully not soon. <laughs>
the guy we got the house from, well, his family, he lived here until he was 98. So wow. that's, I'm going to try to sign up for that if I can. Yeah, um, that sounds good. And no earthquakes here. Not yet, anyway. We had, you know, there was too many earthquakes when we were there in Japan. Yeah, I, I suppose more what I'm getting at is just like, you know, we brought up Johnny Somali and some of the, yes. the more negative things. But the fact that uh, it's like a hundred dollar entry fee basically to get started if you have a, a laptop that that works well enough to do it. And a lot of schools are providing laptops for gaming. So so access not only to games, but also to yes. media and entertainment or producing your own content is very, very easy. And I do feel like that has uh separated all the traffic and my concern is is the content getting better <laughs> no the content is getting much worse and you can see this and it's really scary actually like we sort of like my son is 16 now so certainly there was there were iphones and ipads for some of his growing up but the content explosion hadn't really happened yet right there were at that point, it was like, oh, educational apps on the phone and things like that. But I see kids now and they're just like scrolling through YouTube shorts or TikToks of like yeah. people like lighting shit on fire or can we curse on the show? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay. I'll try to keep it down. Um, and I'm like, oh my God. And the parents don't even know because the kids are just going through it so fast. But yes, the, the content is not good. And in fact, and it's like all these motivational speakers who are just spouting like nonsense. And like, if you were really like so successful, would you really be just like making all this like nonsense content? I get up and at 4 a.m. and I work until 2 a.m. and I only eat chicken that's been oh boiled. And, and then I do 800 push ups in the morning before I have my shower. It's like so, like, this. the worst part about all the content is like not only some of it is a lot of it bad, but people just believe now whatever they see. If there's a guy who's got like a decent camera and has figured out how to put like lower thirds text on the, you know, on his screen, then people are like, oh, that's a professional news broadcaster. Mm -hmm. And you read the comments, you're like, wait, you can't see this just a guy with a, like an iPhone and he just like, and he, and he has a suit, you know, he, he bought a suit and, or he has a green, he's figured out green screen technology. Hey, like, hey, you're giving up all my secrets. <laughs> it's a, but these people are real, like, you know, they're, they're pretending to be newscasters and yeah. they're just the, the stuff they're saying is preposterous and people are just believing it because camera, nice <laughs> camera. And he's at least wearing a suit on the top half of his, of his body. Yeah. Um, so yes, to answer your question, the content is not, I mean, some of it is good, but yeah. there's so much of it. Like, you know, when we were growing up or when I was growing up and your, our parents put us in front of the TV, at least they knew like there was some like moderate content moderation going on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not saying it was all Shakespeare, but you know, you weren't watching people get it set on fire by accident on channel 11, like, or, yeah. you know, that just didn't happen. And now that does happen. <laughs> that happens mm -hmm. all the time. People send me stuff that's outrageous. Like in my messages, that is just, was that could never have happened 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Even, years even, ago. even me on, on X, I'll, I'll look at the responses to a gaming tweet and I'll see something absolutely horrible, like <laughs> a firearm mishap. And I'm like, why is this a reply? I don't want it. I never would have wanted to see this. And now I have, and it's just there. And like, that's what, that's sort of like what we're in for these days. So anyway, anyway. Well, you, it's, it's interesting that you bring up X because they've sort of monetized that now right mm -hmm. you get engagement from any engagement is good engagement and of course when you post something negative you tend to get more engagement than when you post something positive certainly something some guy getting his hand blown off is yeah. considered probably negative and now you're incentivized to post stuff like that um you know which is good for people who are just posting you know normal things and now can make some extra bucks but for people who are now, people are going to game the system and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a social media platform or a video game that has an economy in it where you can make real world dollars out of it. Mm -hmm. People are going to figure out a way to exploit that and get paid off it. You see it in like, you know, any game that has an economy, there'll, there'll be people working in sweatshops, playing the game to farm. And yeah, now they're just farming engagement. 
Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Yeah, no, I hadn't really thought about it that way. I didn't expect the conversation to go this route, by the way, but you do bring up a really good point. It's, you know, the the Johnny Somalis of the world have just figured out, oh, I, I'm making a lot of money being an, a jerk, being yeah. ter being terrible, so who cares? Right, um, and it wasn't, I guess it's not fair to just single out X, because mm -hmm. X started do, doing it when it TikTok's became X. TikTok's terrible. All the people like but the you, recipes. Everything, YouTube, everything, yeah. right? I mean... You know, like back in the day, YouTube was not monetized, right? Mm -hmm. You, when I was in Japan and I was trying to promote my website, I would make videos about things that I thought would people would be interested in, you know, Japan centric things, mm -hmm. but there was no way to monetize it. There was no creator program. It was nothing. It was just YouTube. And so you made the videos to hopefully, you know, get people to watch them based on the merit of the videos. Because although there was no reward otherwise, right? Like, the, okay, well, great. I have people watching my video now, but there was, but there was no like thought of like, I'm going to monetize. Like for me, it was like, I'll get people to look at my website. And I guess that's an indirect form of monetization, but it was mm -hmm. more like, all right, I'm going to get people to look at, look at me and then maybe they'll make it over to my website. But it wasn't like, I wasn't making any dollars from it directly. And I wonder like if I, stuck it out that long in the YouTube world, if like how my content would have changed. Because as soon as I, <laughs> once I made enough money and had to do that, I was like, I'm not making these stupid videos. I don't want people <laughs> like making fun of me. Like, you know, a lot of these comments, like look at this bald asshole. I'm like, you know, I don't need that. Who needs that, right? Yeah. Um, I'm sure you know about- I've never comments. seen a negative comment about my appearance <laughs> online ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. You're still a grind grinding it out though. I mean. You've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, like 15 years. You know, I am very fortunate. I, I have a great job at IGN, and uh, they allow me to do the YouTube thing, and, and I enjoy it. I enjoy talking about what's going on in the industry, and YouTube allows yeah. me a platform where I can talk about, like, the, the news story of the day and sort of my take on it, and I really like that style. I, yeah. I do think that one of the most positive things to come out of, out of the changing landscape is that there are people out there who you can find who you identify with philosophically who uh hopefully are are intelligent and presenting their point well or uh just enjoyable to watch and and you feel like you're you're getting an enjoyable experience out of that at the end of the day i i think that's one of the the more positive things obviously there's a lot of um uh negativity that perpetuates viewership and uh, that's actually, uh, I always reference this YouTube video I watched like five, six years ago about the, the anger germ. Uh, anger or, uh, yeah, just anger in general is one of the most powerful tools that you can utilize to your advantage if, if you're mad about something. So when I make angry content, I, I make sure that I'm being genuine about my personal feelings about a topic and, and presenting that you know, forward, forward to an audience, because I do know how powerful, uh, that emotion can be. And I'll link to it in the description. I've talked about it a few times, but I, I highly recommend you check it out because unfortunately what I see happening is that is perpetuating at a rapid rate and the positivity is sort of getting washed out. Like there's more news, money in it. Yeah. There's no, even hard news was pretty cynical back in the day when we did that. But it was always like, it was meant to make the audience laugh. And I'm, I'm always thinking about like, well, what can I present to the audience that uh, makes them smile for the day? Like even my little silly subscribe joke that I do in the, in the middle of the episode, like don't forget to hit that subscribe button, hit that bell and hit that like button. I try and like weave it in in an entertaining way, right? I failed at that one, but. Um, <laughs> tried, you said tried. Yeah, try, try, but like, <laughs> I, I do hope to see more of that as right now, I do feel like we're in a really negative cycle, especially the, the last few months uh, in terms of the layoffs and just all the negativity happening right now. It's going to, it's a tough 2024. Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts on all the stuff I just talked about? I just kind of rambled for like 10 no, minutes. No, I mean, I, I agree. And, you know, we just started, or rather I just started, you know, I do a, we do a, I do a podcast called The Cat Cast, and I've mm -hmm. done it for a really long time. It's since 2005, so. You still do it with Wombat? Still do it with Wombat, and we have Shipwreck, too. We added Shipwreck, like, cool. a long-ass long time ago, <laughs> also. He's been doing it for fucking forever, too. Um, so, I recently, you know, they have all these great 
software tools now that will cut your podcast up into bite-sized chunks for for YouTube shorts, TikTok, yeah. Instagram reels, whatever. And I started looking into them and I finally found one that was good. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to, I'll, I'll, I can, I can do this and it's not going it, to, it's interesting. And so I started doing them and we have, I, you know, they're, they're, these are all like 60 second clips out of an hour to change show. So they're all like sort of out of context, but just, and I, I admit to a little bit of like engagement farming for science, just to see like what would happen. We were talking about Fortnite because Wombat plays Fortnite like several hours a day. And I asked him, is Fortnite a woke game? I guess it was in the news, you know, woke games were on, were on the, in the crosshairs again, as they still are. Yeah. And I was like, well, is Fortnite a woke game? You know, and he starts explaining like, you know, they, had, they literally have like, you know, not only do they have like pride flags in the game, but they have like a special Martin Luther King Jr. Day and all this stuff. And it's like, oh yeah, we're, this is like the most woke game ever. Like, anyway, so we put that clip on that's it. Like no one is saying like, oh, woke games are bad. Woke games are good. No, nothing. Just like basically that. And like all smiling. And now and, you're and rich. And I spit all over my screen, by the way. Um, no, but like relatively that one got like 2000 views and all other ones get like, you know, 400 views and, and there's like 50 comments look at this look at these assholes these guys are <laughs> these guys can rather talk about this than get girls like what these guys will, You're yeah, it's, no, it's all we're all married with kids all, yeah. all three of us but it's just it's like 50 comments of that and it's like and it's like there's a terrible take terrible take like, what's our take there's no take <laughs> anyway i'll still do it because it's actually like i don't you know the comments like that I've been doing this for too long. I'm sure like you have too. Like there's not much that you could really say to me at this point that I haven't heard already. And that yeah. someone hasn't said better. Although someone had a great one the other day they, they wrote for that, for that video, the comment was uh, podcasting equipment is too inexpensive. <laughs> that was, that was the comment. <laughs> and I, I laughed and, and liked it. That's pretty um, good. That's a good one. Yeah. So I, I've learned that it does actually work, but like, I don't know. I don't need the money that bad. It's cheap ED too woke. That'll be the, the title of this um, episode, yeah, right? I, right. Oh, yeah, people, <laughs> no, people, are the, people are just waiting to get outraged by something. They can't even get through the whole video before they're outraged. Like, <laughs> they can't wait. They don't even apply any, like, thought. Like, hey, did this person actually say anything outrageous? Or I'm just, like, I'm just, like, wait, can't wait. Like, I'm shaking to just to punch into my phone how much of an asshole you are. <laughs> uh. Let's go back to something uh, not about you being too woke, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, purchasing habits. So do you have any data because you've been in the, the finding good deals for, for gamers for a long time and I'm going somewhere with this, but um, okay. have you seen any changes in, in purchasing habits? Like you must have some sort of metric about uh, how much, like what types of things people are buying are, are habits changing? Is it more like subscriptions or is it still games? Like, like what do people go for mostly? Honestly, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I, I do have metrics, but I don't really look at them. Like I yeah. could look, I could dig into like the affiliate stuff and see like, and there was a time when I did that, but I've been doing this too long, man. Just like, but I think, but I could guess probably and yeah. be pretty close. People are buying less games than, you know, more than ever. They're buying less games. That's, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but games, you know, games are lasting longer. Mm -hmm. um, and games are more riskier. They're never been, you know, more risky to make than ever. So mm -hmm. games are, be less games are being made, like big games. Now there's a lot of crappy games that come out. You look at the you look at like the eShop on Nintendo and like any every week it's just a list of like shovelware. mobile mobile phone shovelware even like just like get it on the Switch. Um so that's okay, plenty of games coming out there, but in terms of like the big blockbuster games, we all know this, right? It's just it costs too much money and we can't get the people to stop playing Fortnite and Roblox. <laughs> like we just can't stop. Like we, and, and and you know it do you blame those games? I mean, blame's not the right word because every game that's made, you know, is aspiring to be that type of game, right? The game that you can't put down. I mean, maybe not every game, but 
every game that costs a lot of money to make by a big company, they will, that's what they're hoping for. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm sure that less games are being bought than ever because of all subscription services like Game Pass and just because less games are coming out and because these black hole games that exist now. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, I, no, I think you're you're right on the money. I think people are buying more subscriptions versus games. And I think people are looking for easier access to their games. I'm actually working on something for IGN right now that should be coming out in the next few days where I spoke to a bunch of analysts. So k- keep an eye out for that. But they they kind of actually dive into this a little bit more and, and talk about how habits have changed. And more recently, Phil Spencer uh, with Polygon, I made a whole video about it. He had this conversation about how the landscape has changed. It seems like uh, exclusives are like old school console exclusives just aren't going to be as much of a thing anymore. Uh, PlayStation is saying they're going to get more aggressive with their PC strategy. So that means like fewer core PlayStation 5 exclusives. They've reduced their their console forecast. And uh, just looking at hardware sales, nothing has outsold the PlayStation 2, which is at 155 million. The, the one got really close, the Nintendo DS, which I, I mean, maybe it'll hit 155 million and tie it. But um, there is this interesting landscape change. And I'm curious about one of the rumors in that respect. So the, the latest is that Xbox is rumored to be getting into the handheld market based on how you see habits changing and such. Do you think that would be a good move for Xbox at this time? It looks like probably in addition to all the things that are sucking people's time away that we already mentioned, Mm -hmm. probably people looking for ways to like leverage their existing library. Cause people who are playing now, like they're old, they're probably older. Right. And they probably have like a steam library of 400 games or something. And like they say, like, they don't want to, I mean, I don't know about you, but like, I get like intimidated by new games because I mean, you have to do it. You have to play through these games. You have to like learn, but like, as you get older, you're like, you just want to sit down for 45 minutes, half an hour, play the game that you're like, okay at, Mm -hmm. or moderately good at. Maybe you get a champion in the arena in, in apex. And then you call it a night. Don't. Like even like games, you know, these, these, you got to learn all the controls. And if you don't play the game for a week, you've forgotten all the controls. So yeah, I think people just want to play what they have, what they're comfortable with. And so it would make sense for, a, for like, for Microsoft who has basically are selling you a library in game pass, you know, has looked at what steam has done and said, Hey, they seem to have done pretty well with this. And it gets. It's another way to tie people to that library, mm-hmm. right? It sounds like if you believe the rumors that like Microsoft is holding on by a thread. So like they yeah. want to just, I mean, I don't, you know, you know, the rumors. Um, so like this would be a way to tie people into the, who are sort of in the Microsoft ecosystem now to get them to stay there mm-hmm. or to get them to dive in more. It makes sense. And Microsoft, you know, they make hardware. It's their hardware company. They, Xbox is a fine piece of hardware. Mm-hmm. Didn't get the, the best software support, but the X, the Xbox is, and they are, they've all been pretty good, except for the 360. <laughs> except for the one that everyone's broke. Except yeah. for that one. Yeah, okay, okay. Since I was then, like, well, the 360 was their best one, but you mean like, the initial <laughs> launch with the red ring and everything. Yeah. Except for the one that cost them like billions of dollars to fix. Yeah. <laughs> but, ever, but they learned their lesson and they put out good hardware since then. Um even though I had their lab, I bought a laptop, I bought a Surface 4 and, yeah. you know, for like a couple, you know, it's, that's a great laptop and it mm-hmm. wasn't like super expensive. I could certainly see them, they, look, they still put out the best controller, the, the, yeah. the, uh, the elite controllers, even, you know, it's got some issues, but whatever, it's still the best. I'm sure they could put out a, a, a great handheld unit and, but I don't know if people would buy it though. I see. Like, I, I think it is the best time for them to get in the handheld market. Okay. Think think about what we've heard. Switch Pro delayed to 2025. The okay. portal came out and we know that did well and it's not that great of a piece of hardware. 
Like it's very pretty looking and it's good for using in the house. Uh, Xbox, the the rumor based on the Polygon interview from GDC with Spencer is that uh, this is like a Steam Deck answer or a Lenovo Legion Go or whatever the other ones are, right? So if Microsoft can get in on this and like replace the Series S with a really dope handheld and then th a few years down the line around the launch of uh, GTA 6, they release a really, really powerful piece of hardware. Sarah Bond saying it's going to be the most powerful thing ever. I think that is a killer duo for Xbox to get in on. And it seems like they are making big bets right now in terms of the Xbox brand. There's rumors of this handheld. There's rumors of a more powerful console than ever before. But at the same time that they're doing that, they're saying basically exclusives are done. So, or at least that's what he seems to be alluding to. It's not Starfield and Indiana Jones, but is everything else going to the PlayStation 5? So I, how, do you, how do you feel about that? For so long, we have talked about these, these manufacturers as we got to see the exclusives on your box. And now they're saying, PlayStation's saying it too. Uh, Nintendo's in their own league. They kind of do whatever. But they're basically saying, this isn't tenable for us anymore. So, right. so what's going on there? What in your in the your rent? Opinion? The rent is too damn high. Is what happened, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, at a certain point, you know, like I and, mean, and I don't know if this is still the case, but it probably is. But like on Fifth Avenue, it's a famous shopping district in in Manhattan. The stores that are there, the rent is so high. There's no chance that they make money at the store, right? There's like there's no chance of profit. It's just there specifically as like marketing for the brand, right? And I think like exclusives were like that to a degree, right? And okay, like the, you know, like that Spider-Man game, the last Spider-Man game costs 300. 500, 300 million to make. Eventually, you know, it wasn't always the case. Certainly the exclusives cost more than the regular games, but it wasn't the point, it wasn't to the point where it's like, okay, there's no chance that this is, we can make our money back on this. And now it's like, PlayStation does have market dominance, right? So it's like, it makes really little sense for them to be doing stuff like this mm -hmm. because this is just profit that they're throwing away. Microsoft, it makes more sense because they're, they've lost market share, if anything. But still, like, I don't, like, is it even going to work? Like, what game could they make that people are like, oh my God, I got to buy an Xbox. I mean, yeah. maybe there's, there. it's possible. It's possible, but like, you can't predict that. You can't just say, oh, we're going to make that game, right? Like, <laughs> that's just like something that lightning strikes Power from the World. sky. Is yeah. that game dead already? Is that, I haven't been following. Yeah, well, Power World's going to go multi-platform, but it's available as part of uh, PC Game Pass and Xbox Game Pass. Oh, so, it's already on like, there. Okay. Like, that was this major hit for them, and, like, it wasn't Hellblade 2. It wasn't Halo Infinite. That was their mega hit. It was Pal World, <laughs> right. of all things, right? And when you look at that game, you're like, how, why, who's playing Great this? Why are they playing play. it? It's really simple. Great gameplay is like seeing a huge resurgence right now as like the thing people are hungry for. They just want like great experiences. Helldivers 2, Pal World, Last Epoch, you know. I'm, I'm with you there on Helldivers. Yeah. Pal World, I'm not sure about the, the great gameplay, but well, I didn't play much. I only played it a little. It's janky, right? But at the end of the day, it's like a crafting survival where you, yes. it's Pokemon, but like with some other interesting mechanics going on in it. And Nintendo hasn't innovated, in my opinion, the, the Pokemon brand to the point where somebody like me would be even be interested in playing. I'm like, okay, yeah, it's still Pokemon. I've heard right. Arceus or whatever is interesting, uh, but um, I don't know enough about it and I don't care to. Pokemon Go was the last big Pokemon game that I tried because it was so vastly different from anything that they had done. And, and ARG games at the time were like really interesting and compelling, but um, yeah, I don't know. So it just needed guns to bring you back. Yeah. If they, if they would have put, if they put guns in the next Pokemon game, I would totally buy it just They're to see what they that. were doing, you know, but yeah, that's not going to a happen. mature rated Pokemon game. Yeah. Something like Pokemon that. after hours. But, but Nintendo has really cracked the code. I mean, they are re putting out press releases today to talk about their staff reduction strategies. But um, long story short, 
uh, Nintendo seems to have cracked the code in terms of not having to lay people off, having high profit margins for this old hardware that runs games at like lower frame rates and is uh, performance problematic, but the gameplay is still there and the purchasers are still there. Yep. You know what people, you know what just sold like crazy on the, the Switch? Uh, a remake of a Super Nintendo game, Super Mario RPG and Metroid Prime remake. So like no you, one's you gonna don't ever need to accuse, reinvent the wheel. <laughs> no one's going to ever accuse of Nintendo of not knowing what they're doing. Like they, they don't miss often, right? Like really with anything. They pretty, especially when it comes to making money because mm -hmm. they don't, they don't, they don't make these big games. They don't make risky games. You know, they, the, the, you know, the budgets are small <laughs> compared to, they're, they're, they're nothing compared to these Xbox and, and uh, yeah. PlayStation and what, games. How is that even possible? Like, what do you think the budget for the last Zelda was? 200 million tops? There's no voice acting in it, is there? Yeah, there's like very little million? voice acting talent, but it's super. 200 they, million? No way. It just seems like, like, like. Not even a hundred, not even a hundred. We, we've seen the charts online where like their profit margins are astronomical for like the, the amount that they're spending versus what they're bringing in it. The, the gap is, is quite wide, but I don't have they any know, metrics handy. They know like they have these characters that people will just buy the games, put the characters in the games and people, and you know, make, the games are good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the formula. We don't have to have. 4k or you know we don't have to have anything we don't have to compete on any of that stuff mm -hmm. on any of it just quality game with the characters that people love and that's it and they just do it and then put out like a million different versions of the hardware put just like different colors and different yeah. and <laughs> and you know different editions and because the certain people certain percentage of the people will buy every one of those it's just that it, it's worked for everything they've made and they just like, why why break it? And I, I mean, think, why fix it if it ain't broken? And I think that's the one thing that Xbox never got on lock. They have some good games. They have the Gears franchise. They have the Halo franchise. And I am a huge Hellblade fan, but Hellblade isn't going to move hardware. That's like an art piece, right? It's going to do right. okay. It might break even, and that's that's the best you can sort of hope for from ninja theory and I'm, I'm super glad that studios like that exist but it's it's not going to compete with god of war ragnarok no you know uh, microsoft needed microsoft to, to have a chance this generation i don't know maybe this is crazy talk but i feel like they needed halo to hit a home run like mm -hmm. like a, a grand slam and it was like a single if that it was like, like good it, at launch it, it was good. It was, it was that. I mean, for what I, all the reviews that I read, I thought it was like really overrated, but mm -hmm. like in terms of just the single player, but I was expecting like the multiplayer to be like this next generation experience. Like at this point we were all used to like battle Royale and yeah. different versions of multiplayer, not just the old halo, but with the updated graphics mm -hmm. and and it never really like. I'm still shocked that there's no battle royale for that game. I mean, I know a, I'm sure a fan made up it. on it. <laughs> You're kidding, really? Yeah. So like, uh, here's here's what was really interesting about Halo Infinite. Halo Infinite is really in a great place right now. Okay. But the problem is, it was stagnant for like three seasons. Not stagnant, but like they were doing updates, but they weren't substantial enough that they brought in like this this massive audience. But anybody who is playing halo infinite right now is largely quite happy there's a lot of different modes they're doing regular events mm. they have uh is, well i'm finishing out my season five battle pass which is like way overdue um they they have a, a somewhat healthy uh strategy for getting people to play the game to earn rewards in the game um the, well as a halo as a big halo yeah. fan what do you think of what I said? Like, do you think like Battle Royale? Like, I, cause I say this a lot. I feel like Battle Royale was like really sorely missed from that game and could have, could have really like got a lot of players just on board with Xbox in general if it was all that. I don't know if there's one answer to what went wrong with Halo Infinite, but I do know a big part of it is uh, multiplayer just not being supported in an interesting enough way to garner a larger audience. You know, 343 is suffering all these massive layoffs. There's like 
you know, constantly reports about like turmoil internally. And that's all really, really unfortunate. But at the, at the end of the day, like they just, I love Halo Infinite. I probably, I think I played 20 hours of Halo Infinite this week because I wanted to like finish out the, the event that they're doing. And I play that game. I play that game regularly since launch, but I didn't spend any money in it because I right. just don't support. I spent $10 on Halo Infinite. That's how much I've spent. I bought the first season pass and then I earned all the other ones after that because I refuse right. to support microtransactions in, in games, but I will support battle passes, but that's about how far I'm willing to go with it because I think, what about way, in free games? Free uh, to play games? well, no, I play Marvel snap for like a thousand hours and I, I've not spent a single dollar in that game. I right. just, the problem is microtransactions start infecting the overall design philosophy of every product that you play. And I, I don't think enough people like, I just sound, I feel like I'm the crazy person yelling at the cloud right at this point, because I've been saying it since for 15 years, like you can't buy microtransactions because what happens is that starts infecting the overall design philosophy of the products that we play. They're not really problematic except for in that respect, <laughs> right? Right. Where, which is uh, a big problem. Back in the day, you would play a game and you would earn cool armor sets and stuff for doing cool stuff in the game. And all of that was part of your $70 purchase, $60 purchase. Sorry. Now your games are $70, $100 for early access. And then you go to a store where, how did you get that cool horse? Oh, I spent $60 on it in Diablo four, you know, and that microtransaction cost has now been baked into development costs. So all of it has sort of snowballed into a perfect storm and we are seeing the negative effects of it finally tumbling and falling apart. Right? Well, none of it makes the game better. That's none the problem. Of, the, the games aren't better worse. because of them. As a matter of fact, I'd argue that they're worse because you're not earning that cool thing. You're just spending yes. $60 on it or worse. Or twelve dollars so there's fewer cool things for you to chase in the game which means you're you're playing less the design philosophy is to keep people in game engaged in games longer so they're grindier and less fun they start feeling like a job because the longer you play a game the more likely you are to be upsold at the cash register on your way out with that chocolate bar oh hey did you see this week we got the limited time thing where uh, you can be batman and fortnite so like this whole, th this is very, very problematic. And the thing is there's whales out there willing to support microtransactions and the microtransactions now get rolled into the development costs of the game because, um, pirate software talked about this. Sorry to sort of go on a tangent. It's been on my yeah. mind for a long time. Um, pirate software talked about this. He said, you know, I worked on Starcraft too. Uh, we released one microtransaction and it made more money than the whole game. One microtransaction. So that philosophy is just like at the head of every executive of these companies. They don't care about the art of the game. They don't care about the overall design philosophy. And that's why I think we are seeing a problematic collapse of the AAA industry. Well, the double A is saying, well, we just love making great games. Here we are. And we've come up with a healthy balance between all of these ideas. Hell divers being a great example where you can earn all of that stuff or you can buy it. But the gameplay loop is incredibly fun. It's all cosmetic. There's nothing that's like game breaking in it. And uh, more and more of those games are popping up and seeing huge success, which is exciting to me because it's, it feels like things are getting back to the natural order. Sorry for the tangent. No, no, that's, and I agree, because I, I play Helldivers, and the store there is unobtrusive. It's like, you could never look at it or look at it every day, and you wouldn't be missing anything, right? Like, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just like, oh, it's just some green armor with whatever. It's not, not no big deal. Um, and also, it's a $40 game. And a live service game. Yeah. Yeah. So like, look at hell divers. That's what I hope the AAA industry does because I think they got too used to the $60,000 whales buying their Diablo immortal cores to get the five star gems or whatever you needed in that game. And, uh, I, th I think it's really hurt 
the entire industry. And that's part of the reason why uh, growth is sort of stagnated because I do think consumers are starting to wake up to it. It's like, hey, I don't want to come home from work and work. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think games like Helldivers do strike a really good balance. And I think you'll probably, you know, the, the game industry is always like leeching off each other, right? So mm -hmm. everyone's looking at Helldivers because it's so successful. Like, oh, how can we make a game like Helldivers, right? And of course, it's going to come out in five years and people, everyone will have moved on by then. Mm -hmm. But you look at it and you say, like, what can you learn from Helldivers? Like, what, what makes Helldivers special? And mm -hmm. I think, like, they nailed, like, the present, like, they, they have a, a, the game looks great, but it's, like, limited in its focus, right? You're on the surface of the planet running around and you're shooting things, like, e either they're bugs or terminators. And the presentation is really good. Like, it has, a, yeah. like, world building, even though, like, you really never go anywhere. <laughs> like, you know, you just, you're on your ship and you go on down on a planet yeah. and, it's, you know. Wasn't, but, like, wasn't the lore, like, no more sex this week because... <laughs> oh, is because, that... Like, I you, yeah, apparently the in-game lore is that like uh, sex isn't allowed right now, like procreation isn't allowed because you failed the mission, so we can't support more, more uh, troops or something like oh that. Oh my god! So like they have a lot of fun with like the 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 game versus real world effects of you playing the game too. And you know what? Like stuff like that, like that's not expensive. That's just some clever guys yeah. and gals sitting around going. Hey, like, let's, how can we make this feel real to the players? Mm -hmm. How can we like, you know, at the end of the day, you're just shooting bugs and robots, right? But you feel like you're doing a lot more and there's a lot of like humor in the game and, mm -hmm. and cleverness in the game beyond just the, the fun gameplay loop. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, that's, that's the type of game that I like now that I can jump in, play a half an hour of it's not complex. I didn't have to, I didn't have to go and read like a bunch of websites to figure out like, what, what am I doing here? I just jumped in. It's like, you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. It was great. Yeah. You, you know what, uh, Halo needed to do. They needed to be more like hell divers. That's what they needed to do really. Yeah. And, and they've added that this season, but is it too little or something sort of like it where like you can do team-based objectives, but it might be too little too oh, late. Oh, it's too late. It's way yeah. too late. I mean, that. Like I said, that game needed to come out and it did get great reviews when it came yeah. out. Like everyone did fawn over it. And I thought, you know, after having made it through the single player, I was like, we play the same game. Yeah. But, um, it was fine, but even, it was, people loved it. So that mm -hmm. certainly didn't get dinged in the reviews, but I think by the word of mouth sort of killed it. Like yeah. people were like, this, this is just halo. Where's battle like Royale? next gen, where's battle Royale mm -hmm. and where's next gen halo. This is like, this is like grandpa's halo. Mm -hmm. no. Maybe not. But I hear you. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. Uh, industry wise, after listening to my big long spiel, I appreciate you being kind enough to do that. <laughs> uh, where do you think we're going to go in, in like five years? You've been doing this 20 years. What do you think the next five years holds? We're in a difficult year now. Will we come out of it by then? I mean, it sounds like there's more consoles coming. And I mean, like, in terms of, I don't just mean like, pro versions of these current ones yeah. i mean like a next gen of consoles we're not just going to be playing off of our apps on our tv mm -hmm. uh, off yet. our g our g force i just saw like my tv had the g force now app and i went to check it out by the way but like it doesn't work with all your games i want to play hell divers i want to play hell divers on this TV, big tv behind me instead of on my on my non hdr computer display mm -hmm. um so there are more, there's more hardware coming out. So it looks like everyone's going to give it another goal, another, another go rather, but with the caveat that like we talked about, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. More games like, like hell divers, like free to play multiplayer. I mean, just it's, although it is hard to hit, you know, there's been a lot of failure. You know, we talk about successes of games like apex Fortnite. But there's not too many of those, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's like seven. There's more uh, pirate games, like what was Skull and Bones? Like Skull and Bones is being widely panned. I have to imagine that that's going to be a huge blow for Ubisoft. Yeah, no one's gonna. I mean, that game was forever. Into, I remember playing that at E3 when it was. Oh God! Did you, did you play it when it was something else? Like uh, I think so. I remember it was one like rabbits. It was in the same pre presentation with with one of the rabbits. Yeah, I Mario rabbits maybe the first one. Mm -hmm. 
it was a long time ago and they like it sat on a shelf or sat in development hell for a while after that so mm -hmm. i played the demo <laughs> and i was like no one's gonna buy this no one's looking for this pirates is not what's hot right now mm -hmm. i don't know Assassin's yeah Creed. so so you do think that the industry is going to sort of stabilize or at least continue like it's going to evolve in your mind do i have that right but but a it's, little bit yes. of the same also you're seeing it right now. What you're seeing right now, more of that, right? Like more people are going to try to find these, these games that can hit. How can we make a game that hits, that can be profitable, that's like a, a, a service game? Because that's still people want to make service games, even though you, we're seeing all these high-profile ones fail. They all still think they can make the next big one. And it's, it's what's hot. That's, you know, why invest... Three hundred million dollars in a game, when like a Spider-Man game, when you know like you can only sell X amount of copies, you can never really, you're not going to make a billion dollars off that game. Mm -hmm. When you can invest the same amount of money in like a live service game, and maybe look, maybe you'll make zero dollars, but maybe you'll be the next Fortnite. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you can, you nobody knows, right? Because like Power World comes out, okay, that's not the next Fortnite, but I'm sure, you know, it didn't cost very much to make, did it? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you're gonna still see that all these companies still shooting for shooting for that unicorn, that yeah. that next live service game because the payoff is is big. It it makes them so delusional that they think like that a Suicide Squad game is gonna be that game. Like, yeah. Well, like, here here's the crazy thing. Now that you bring up Suicide Squad, WB made a billion dollars on Harry Potter, right? And they're like, yeah but we're going to give suicide squad type games another shot. It's like, what, what are you talking? Because, you made a billion. Right. Because, but how much did it cost to make that game? It was probably, I mean, it wasn't 300 it was, million. Okay. So that's great. That's yeah. a great profit, but 2 billion. Now that's great. <laughs> 3 billion. That's the way they, it's dumb. It's so dumb, mm. but that's, I swear. That's what they're thinking. Is they no, think, right. Look, these guys, these guys did it. Why? And look at that game. What's so great about that. They don't see, they just don't see. They think that they they can do it. They can. If they were lucky. We can be lucky. Yeah. And it's, and it's they're so deluded that they even think they like a franchise like Suicide Squad, which is like let's let's be realistic. Like it's not like a world. It's not even like in the top any list that you make yeah. a franchise for anything. They spent so much money making that game, thinking that that could that could be the next one. They have the rights to the entire Justice League and they choose to do a Suicide Squad game where you kill them. Um, like, it's just baffling to me that they thought that this was a good idea and also that it was a good idea when there's no Suicide Squad hype right now. There's no movie. There's there's like nothing happening with that brand. It's and like we all watch the Avengers game do the exact same thing right before it. and the yeah. avengers the timing was a little off on that because the movies it was like a, a yeah. dark spot between the movies but i mean you cannot compare avengers and suicide squad in terms of like how popular they are they're not they're you know <laughs> one is on the top floor and one is like who yeah um and yet and yet they're like here let's make this game for hundreds of millions of dollars and this this could be it this could be the big one yeah two like there were 200 <laughs> concurrence last week. It's like, like insanely low numbers on steam for that game. Uh, I do worry about like, it's made by uh, Rocksteady, One of my favorite game developers of all time. And uh, I've been very hard on the game. Like I love Rocksteady, but this game just is not it. Well, you and talked about know. how the microtransactions drive the, the building of the game. And I'm sure that this is the a well, plus example of that. I'm probably going to make a video about it, but Joker just came out, right? They have an intro cutscene that's like one of those drawing cutscenes. So clearly their budget's been reduced for what they're available to create for these seasons because they see the sales aren't there. WB even called it a miss. And what's the gameplay? Level up to level 35 by doing an incursion because it gives the, the best XP or the little shield things with two on it and uh, do that for like three hours and then you can do the Joker mission where you fight the Brainiac who copies one of the heroes from the campaign. It's Green Lantern. And then you kill him and you get a little story. And that's it. And then you get the Joker. But it's like they've created for free for free. But the wow. thing is, he's also you can just get him right away by buying buying him in the store. 
for right. 1000 Lex Luthor credits, whatever that converts to in real world dollars. Which so is he, like saying, uh, hey, we our gameplay is like so crappy that why don't you just skip it and for $10? Yeah. yeah. It's so fun that you should just pay us $10. And it's skip it. free four <laughs> hours of gameplay that you have to grind through. It's free. You got to do a right. very on fun grind to unlock the character, but it is free. So. That, yeah that and that, that's mobile what I, gaming mechanic that everybody loves yeah you know, that's what I that we want to see in our in our main console games but their concurrence on steam went from 200 to 2500 so it's an improvement but it's still dangerous for them to make investment continue investing in this this product like they need to finish out whatever they've promised and then get the hell out of it yeah i'm sure you know, and move on Anyway, yeah, I just real quick, my two cents on the whole situation are we're at the like bad time right now. 2024 is the reset that I've talked about where everybody has bought everything that they're going to be able to buy because ch cash was cheap back when the Activision acquisitions and Bethesda's and Destiny's and Bungie's mm. were happening. Now we're in the thick of it because reality is set back in for everybody. And we're kind of back to where we were in 2019. There's still going to be growth, but everybody who thought there was going to be this exponential growth into the future forever, because everybody was locked in their house is having a huge wake up call. So this is the bad time. This is the layoffs and the, the getting down to the brass tacks of what is the best thing that consumers actually want to spend money on. And, and I think we're seeing successes in that space. And I think we're going to see more of that. And hopefully uh, the AAA space has enough in their coffers to survive <laughs> for lack of a, a better term and uh, figure that out for themselves. They're going to, they're just learning a very hard lesson right now, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. You cannot just will a hit into existence mm -hmm. because you want it to be so. <laughs> Exactly. GP, it's been great catching up. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we go? No, nah, you can uh, check me out on the CADCast podcast. That's our podcast. If you want to hear more of this nonsense, leave me some <laughs> mean messages on TikTok and go for it. Have fun. Those are all me. Those are my alt accounts. <laughs> yeah. Nice. You're good. Uh, it's great hearing from you and it's great catching up. I really appreciate you making the time to chat. Anytime. All right. Well, I'm going to try and do the outro and not break it. You know, I'll just do it casually uh thank you so much for watching everybody thank you so much to the members i greatly appreciate you thank you cheapy for joining me it was great to catch up see you again soon and see y'all again soon bye for now everybody